um, you'll see that. There you go. All right. So we'll go ahead and kick it off. Good evening, everyone. Hello, how are you doing? Warm salutations on this evening. My name is Asma Chowdhury. I'm a board member of the Washington Sculptors Group and the host of the WSG Happy Hours that we've had every month. So thank you again for joining us tonight. The Washington Sculptors Group, as you may know, was founded in 1984 and is one of the oldest and largest sculpture groups in the United States, if you can believe that. We are an all volunteer organization, so we need you to volunteer, to actively participate, so much more on that later. We are very happy to welcome our WSG members, thank you, and many folks from the greater DC metro area community. We are so happy to have you join us for this continuation of the conversation about some very important topics that artists need to know regarding art and the law, part two. We will take questions as part of the discussion, but please ask you to write them down as they occur, uh, come to mind in the chat. Um, we will work to address those questions as they occur, hopefully topic-wise, okay? Uh, since we are not doing individual participant introductions tonight, um, in an essence to save time, but please let us know your name whenever you're asking a question. We'd love to know who you are. After the event, you're welcome to stay online for a brief after party of informal conversation. Our two moderators this evening are Eric Salarier and Joan Weber. Eric Salarier, if you don't know, you're gonna know, right? Uh, a wonderful person who lives and works in the DC metro area. He has a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Maryland and has an MFA from the University of Cincinnati. Eric is an artist, educator, reviewer, and curator. Eric describes a central theme of his work as biological evolution associated with human impact. Pretty incredible. Much of his work can be seen as designing opportunities to allow audiences to construct personally meaningful understandings of our world. Now Joan Weber is and was on the board of WSG for many years, and she still came back, right? <laughs> she is a business person who, after teaching for 11 years at the university level, has built her own printing machinery expert business with her aunt. For 23 years, she was a sales VP in a large printing company here in DC. For the last 17 years, has worked in the commercial real estate development. Hi, Joan and Eric, take it from here. And I just formally retired and gave up my office. And some of the art that I have in my life is still in the office because for the moment it looks better there than it will anywhere I have. And I'll go back and claim it. Um, but I think it's my way of keeping my toe in that office. Uh, that's a new use, use for art is, is to claim territorial rights. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, Eric, as, as many of you may know, Eric and I, since the start of the pandemic, and it was sort of an accident in that a program got canceled by the DC library system that Eric had started um, to for prof basically professional development and legacy programming directed to all of our members at whatever stages of their your careers, our careers in, in the field. All apparently except all those programs and webinars, there are about eight of them now, um, are on YouTube, except this one, except the last program with Janet, which will be on very shortly. I personally am very excited to present tonight's program, which is a continuation of our first program uh, that we had in May. As I said before, some of you may have heard, I listened last night to the full first program, and it was, it's for, I, I think I used the word brilliant when I wrote, when I wrote Janet, and she should not blush. Um, it was really a wonderful program and rehearing it was richer even than the first time. So it will be on YouTube. It will be well worth following up and going back to take a look, even if you've seen it before or heard it before. Our tonight's panelist, Janet Fries, is a longtime friend of the Washington Sculptors Group. Mostly she's been working behind the scenes. Janet is of counsel at the law firm of Fegre, Brinker, Bill and Reed, LLP. I pronounced it correctly this time, I hope. <laughs> You're doing great, Joan, thank you. Okay, uh, two, in 2004, she joined the board of directors of the Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts, WALA. And it's through WALA that we became associated as an organization with Janet. Uh, she also mentioned in her last uh, conversation uh, being active in a group called the Copyright Alliance. And I did add some information, a link to that group at the end, and maybe Janet will tell us a little bit about that later on in the program. 
Janet's field as an expert is in issues of contract negotiation, website review, copyright and trademark protection and enforcement. And as an interesting sideline to her life, Janet is also an experienced photo photojournalist, editorial and fine art photographer. Her work has been published and exhibited widely. It's been acquired through the permanent collections, for example, including the National Portrait Gallery and the Oakland Museum. Janet has been a friend to WSG through WALA, is on the WSG advisory board for the past several years. And with my gratitude, and everybody on, everybody's gratitude should be, has kept us compliant as a 501c3, um, which is not always an easy task, but Janet has, Janet has shepherded us to do that correctly. In our last program, we covered primarily contracts and insurance. We were talking about working with galleries, art advisors, and as that's all shifting, what do contracts for pop-up art programs look like? And we had a, a, the conversation about things like that. We spent a little bit of, of time on copyright questions about the copyright associated with your work, with, with one's own copyright. We, now it's gonna be a much larger picture because we realized that was a, a much bigger conversation. We're very pleased to have you here for this conversation. Welcome, Janet. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Joan. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for coming this evening. I hope that um, you find it informative. And uh, as, as was said, please um, do ask questions as we go along. Um, the, um, now, can you both see me and the PowerPoint? Am I like a little, Thing on your screen, and then okay, just wanted to make sure. Janet, um, before, and, before, I'm sorry. Before we get to the PowerPoint, can I ask you the question that I don't? Should I? Is that would this be the time to ask you that? You sure. want to start with me? Sure. I, one of one of the reasons that started the conversation about copyright was a the the idea that we were talking about making catalogs of each of the WSG exhibitions using the photographs that were submitted. We have the juror statement. We have the artist statement. Boy, it's all there. We can use something like issue. A software to create catalogs that would be a real benefit for our folks, for our members. And then it occurred to me as I was taking a shower one day that involves an awful lot of copyright questions because we'll be dealing with images that are once that are removed. They're not necessarily the artist's images to work with. And I didn't know what that meant. And so I had a qu the question formed for me most simply, if a sculptor hires a photographer to photograph their work, they wanna use that photograph for promotion. Who owns the, clearly the sculptor owns the copyright on their sculpture, but who owns the copyright on the image of that sculpture? And if in some way that image is abused, because it would be the image now that we're all working more digitally and creating, you know, selling work even digitally with digital images, if somebody abuses that image, who's hurt? Whose copyright is infringed? And that sort of started the question that I wanted to put to you. Um, I don't know it's that's... a very good, that's a very good question, Joan. And uh, let me just jump in and start with that one. Um, the, uh, historically, any picture of any work of art um, was treated as copyrightable subject matter by the photographer. So, um, but there can be paperwork between the commissioning party and the photographer uh, transferring that ownership. But when a photographer, usually when a photographer presses the button on their camera, as soon as they create that image, they own a federal copyright in the photograph that they've just taken. Mm -hmm. Now, let's back up for just a little bit. Long time ago, before everybody had a great camera in their phone and, um, it, there, and before everything was digital, all of the museums had licensing entities and you could uh, license a transparency, for example, of an image from the museum or the gallery. And you would get an, a transparency. And even if it was, you know, Leonardo or Rembrandt, it would say copyright the National Gallery or copyright, you know, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Well, hello, um, Rembrandt's been dead for a long time, as has Leonardo, and they were claiming that the photograph was a separately copyrightable uh, work. And the, um, 
the courts have ruled that for two dimensional works of art, like Rembrandt and, um, uh, and I don't remember who else I said, Warhol, whoever it was, oh, um, that, that, the, um, that that's not copyrightable. Yeah, you have to get your lights set up and sometimes the paint is reflective, so you have to make adjustments. And if you want accurate color, whoa. Um, hang on just for a second. I don't okay. know what I said wrong. I, you know what, Joan, you were saying I stay very still. I think I'm going to have to move around a little more because I think the lights in this room are uh, motion. At, yeah, they have all these green techniques here. The lights go out if they're if the room is not being used. So I got to wave your hand. Activate the lights. Yeah. Okay. So, so the courts have ruled. Uh, I don't know. It's about ten years ago that two dimensional depictions of works of art are not copyrightable subject matter. Oh. But three-dimensional works of art that are depicted, works of sculpture, because there are so many choices to make as to what angle to take, uh, how to light that, how to show the texture, how to shade it, and so forth, that that perhaps is copyrightable subject matter. So my advice would be that when a sculptor any of you on the, on the call tonight, on the Zoom meeting, if you're going to engage a photographer, that you should have a written agreement. Ideally, it would be a work made for hire agreement and all of the rights would belong to you, but it has to say that in the agreement. It has to use that phrase, work made for hire, and say for the sole and exclusive ownership and use by me, the sculptor, and no rights remain with the photographer. Absent that, and absent any paper, um, the photographer would retain whatever copyrights there are, and um, and an implied license, there could be an implied non-exclusive license without a writing, but even a an exclusive license would require a signed piece of paper. So um, now the other thing is going back to the two dimensional versus three dimensional. It is conceivable that if a photographer, like let's say you do a bas relief that's very shallow relief so that it's approaching two dimensions that there is some texture and so forth but that might move in the direction of the two-dimensional images rather than the three-dimensional because your angle, you're really going to be photographing it only, you know, from a certain angle and, you know, you're not going to be moving, you know, it isn't a real three-dimensional object in the same sense as most sculptures are. So that could be an exception. But by and large, uh, the rule would be to get something in writing, make it clear with the photographer, uh, and um, and proceed, you know, after that uh, agreement has been signed by both parties. So um, that was a good segue into. Uh, oh, Joan, you had a follow up question. Yeah, I just have two 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 little quick questions on it. Is attribution always then a the an excellent choice to do to attribute the work to the photographer? Does that do anything that helps indicate? Uh, in addition to getting something in writing. Um, is attribution an important thing? I think many photographers would appreciate that. Um, technically speaking, the uh, right of attribution uh, is only an absolute requirement in a couple of instances. If a photograph is created with the per for the purpose of exhibition, which a picture of a sculpture would not be, right. I mean, that right, the sculpture is created for exhibition, but the picture of the sculpture is created to market the photograph. So it would not be uh, eligible, the photographer would not be eligible for 106A rights. Those are the moral rights of attribution and integrity. Okay. Uh, and, um, and then the, um, so that, so that you, and then the only other instance uh, requiring it would be if 
for some reason, you had a Creative Commons license. There are what are called royalty-free attribution licenses, and then you must provide the attribution in precisely the way that um, is laid out in the uh, Creative Commons agreement, or it would be copyright infringement. But if you, um, if you execute a work made for hire agreement and the rights are all owned by the sculptor or the gallery on behalf of the sculptor or whatever, then um, there would be not necessarily any need for attribution depending on what the terms of the agreement said. So it depends. Thank you. Um, Thank but it's never a bad idea. It's never a bad idea to provide attribution. I don't think uh, photographers tend to be offended when they're provided uh, attribution, but it, it isn't always required. In fact, not very often. So um, tonight we wanted to get deep into, I'm calling this fundamentals, but there are a lot of fundamentals and some of them are a little complicated. The PowerPoint that we're going to be looking at will be available to you after the program. Is that right, Joan and mm -hmm. Asma, you're going, and Eric, you're going to provide that to people that request it. So yes. do not feel if I go too fast by a slide and you wrote down three of the four things that are mentioned and it was like, oh my God, you're gonna, don't worry <laughs> about taking notes so much because this will be uh, provided to you. And then the other thing that I wanted to say is that some of my old photographs are sprinkled through this PowerPoint as illustrations. And don't strain your mind thinking what is the connection between the photographs and the, um, and the text. There's not much. Uh, I just kind of put them in there to make the slides more um, appealing uh, than just having um, a bunch of text. So um, anyway, so I wanted to just summarize uh, some of the things that are um, covered in the PowerPoint and that are important when we when anyone talks about copyright. Um, the fact that it comes from our constitution, um, that it is federal law, uh, that it covers a variety of subject matter. Um, there are ownership issues, there are formalities such as the use of copyright notice and registration with the copyright office. And then we're going to touch just briefly, I hope, on um, infringement and the remedies for infringement and then the DMCA. So I hope we can get through all of these things and have time for questions and maybe even do some more things, but there, there is a lot to cover. So, um, so the, here we go. This is the clause in the uh, constitution. So copyright, a lot of people don't realize that, but this um, article one, uh, section eight, clause eight is the basis of both our copyright and our patent law. Um, authors and inventors. And authors, and I think I mentioned this in our last session, is the general term that is used for all kinds of creators. So an artist under the copyright law is an author. Um, now the law that we have, some people still refer to as the new Copyright Act, although it's been in effect since January 1st, 1978. It's the Copyright Act of 1976 but it, it's been amended all the time, including this list and um, the most recent um, amendment to the Copyright Act that I can think of at the moment is actually of interest to you. It's called the CASE Act. And the CASE Act um, is the Copyright Alternative and Small Claims Act. There is now a small claims court for copyright matters. We can talk about that a little bit more later, but for people that don't have the time or the money, which you need a lot of each of those elements um, to do any copyright litigation, this Copyright Small Claims Court, which is run through the Copyright Office, is a great new addition and a great uh, option for people wishing to enforce their rights. Um, so copyright is actually a bundle of rights and these are the things that are bundled. So it's the right to reproduce, to make copies, the right to adapt a work, that is to create derivative works. There is um, distribution, and then in the case of sound recordings, digital transmission of those sound recordings. 
and then public performance and public display. And those rights um, can be divisible so that you can license the right to reproduce and distribute, but withhold other rights. And as we talked before, uh, you know, you can make exclusive licenses, non-exclusive licenses, or sell out, sell everything uh, as a work made for hire. In addition to those rights, there are more recently uh, moral rights, that is more recently here in the United States, the droit moral, as the French say, and those rights are attribution, the right to have your name connected or not connected to a work, and integrity, which prohibits distortion, mutilation, uh, modification, or destruction. Oddly, this um, last right, integrity, also applies to conservators. If you, um, if work needs to be done, if there's been some damage to a work and a conservator does a botched job, they have infringed your right of integrity and they are liable for copyright infringement for doing a bad job of conservation. A lot of people don't realize that. So that's a fun fact. Um, these moral rights can be waived by an artist in writing but they can't be transferred. And moral rights, again, attribution and integrity are only available to living artists and the work had to have been created or first published after June of 91. So those mature uh, artists that are listening, if you have works that were created in the 1980s and um, then they and they have been published, that is perhaps sold or copies of them sold, then they would not be eligible for um, moral rights. Um, but none of these, neither of these moral rights are um, applicable to anything other than this very narrow definition of a work of visual art. So it has to be. Um, if it's a, I mean, it can be a painting that exists or a drawing that exists in, in one copy, and most of your sculptures are going to be in one copy. However, if you do like uh, a mold and make multiple copies, then those copies would have to be signed and numbered in order to qualify as a work of visual art. Um, and uh, yeah. So that definition. And then, um, so moving on, the, um, a lot of people think that there are um, other state laws that apply, and there's really very few. When the new Copyright Act went into effect in 1978, it uh, preempted all of the prior state laws that existed, and any common law was also preempted. So copyright is almost entirely uh, a feder federal law, a matter of federal law. However, the courts have ruled that you may, that states may create additional rights as long as they are not competing with the federal law. If states want to provide additional protection, then that is fine. So for example, um, under the, um, uh, uh, moral rights under 106A, uh, it applies to works of visual art in editions of 200 copies or fewer. So for um, uh, photographs and prints, if they're signed and numbered and they're an edition of 200 or fewer, they're covered by um, the, right of the rights of attribution and integrity. However, in New York, that number is 250. So those extra 50 copies, you can be protected in New York, but not, not elsewhere. And um, in California, um, they tried doing a resale royalty act some time ago, uh, the droit de suite, the right that follows, the economic right, so that when works are resold, artists get a piece of the action in other countries. And for a while, that happened in California as well, although it never worked very well. 
Um, it was tested once in 1980 and passed. The uh, courts determined that it did not, um, did not compete with the federal copyright law and was something extra offered by the state of California and therefore was constitutional. But then it was tested again just a few years ago in 2018 and they determined, yeah, it's okay as, um, as but except for the commerce clause, it gets in the way of that. So it was determined to be unconstitutional and um, voided. So there is um, a draft of federal resale royalty protection that, um, what's his name, uh, Jerry Nadler, who I gather just won the Democratic um, primary in New York, he has what he calls his artist protection bill. He's introduced it a few times. And I, I hear that he's going to be introducing that again, trying to get a federal Resale Royalty Act. Stay tuned on that one. I have no idea what the chances are of anything like that happening. But um, but artists, I think, were relieved. Although Carolyn Maloney, um, th there were two excellent. We don't want to get too political here, but in any case, Jerry Nadler is is uh, um, interested in resale royalty as a federal law. So um, these are the areas of authorship, the top, the um, kinds of authorship that are protected under the Copyright Act. So literary works, and um, if you didn't know, you'll be interested to know that the first category of literary works includes computer programs, which we always think of in the same breath as, uh, as poetry and prose. I'm kidding, of course, <laughs> but that's where it, they categorize it. Then musical works, um, dramatic works, uh, pantomimes, chore anyway, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works, there we go, and uh, motion pictures, audiovisual, sound recordings, and architectural works. So those are all the things that are protected, and anyone who creates any one of those things is an author. Um, and then also protected is, um, excuse me, our compilations where you um, select, uh, coordinate, and arrange works into a larger uh, work, which is called a compilation, sometimes a collective work, and then also derivative works are protected. Um, when a derivative work gets protection, the, um, there is still protection for the underlying work on which it was based. Um, no copyright protection for ideas, procedures, processes, systems, all of these things. Note about a little more than halfway down, there's the list on the list, it says concepts. I think you're all familiar with the term conceptual art. That means that if concepts are not protected by copyright, conceptual art is probably going to fall through that hole too. So there are there are very sophisticated works of art that are that don't pass muster with the Copyright Office as being uh, sufficiently creative. So unfortunately, there are some beautiful works that are very complicated in their concept, in the perhaps just the selection of an unusual material. Um, or perhaps an unusual scale. And they can be very simple, very elegant, very beautiful. And the Copyright Office will reject an application for registration. And it is heartbreaking to see that. But unfortunately, the more complicated a work is, the more curlicues and dips and, and um, you know, uh, elements there are, the more likely it will be to satisfy a copyright examiner who is never to be confused with an art historian or an art critic, um, rather just, you know, hopefully a bright person who knows copyright law. And, um, and they are looking for a sufficient indication of creativity and authorship. So, um, so as I said, I mean, you've seen 
paintings that are, you know, like the whole canvas is black and that's not gonna get copyright protection. Um, it, it, it is also possible that just a very simple shape for a sculptor would not be copyrightable. It doesn't mean that it won't be respected by your peers, that it won't be valued by art collectors, but it will probably be difficult to um, maintain, to enforce any rights against someone who tries to copy it. So, um, oh, come on. I thought I was w wiggling around pretty good there. I'm sorry, this is gonna be, I don't know how to permanently do this, but you have to be proud of the law firm for having green technology, right? I'll just keep yep. turning the lights back on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I am sorry though. Um, anyway, so I think most of you work independently, but you can also, of course, work in coordination with another author to collaborate on a piece. And um, it is also possible, of course, that you would be um, uh, employed or commissioned to create uh, a work of art um, as a work made for hire, and then the commissioning party would own that uh, copyright. But that would have to be in writing and signed by both parties. So, um, uh, so now works of art, in order to be um, considered a work made for hire, have to fall into one of nine categories that are set forth in the statute. And sculpture is not one of those categories, but the way around it is, that, uh, and some commissioning parties will do this, is that they will commission a sculptural work for example, for the entrance to a building or for the lobby or the atrium of a building. And then they will say that um, that, that, that is one element of a collective work, that there's the architecture that surrounds it. There may be um, a landscape, if it's in an atrium or something, there may be landscape architecture as well as the building. There may be um, uh, other sorts of lighting design or interior design. And so um, your, your sculpture that has been commissioned could possibly be a work made for hire as an element of a collective work. Um, so be alert to that. Yes. What does, what does that mean in terms of the cop? I, I'm not clear what that means. Well, that means that means <laughs> that that you could be asked as a sculptor, you could be asked to sign a work made for hire agreement, and if it is part of a collective work, then you may want to do that uh, and sign over your copyright. You know, maybe with certain conditions, maybe right. with um, extra money if they're buying all the rights, um, but. Uh, if it is not a part of a collective work, in other words, if somebody just says, I want um, you to create this sculpture for me and I want to own it as a work made for hire, no, because it's not one of the nine categories, so it can't be a work made for hire. They could get an exclusive license or you could assign all of the copyrights to them, but it is not a work made for hire. And when we get to the, well, I can just say now, the difference is that a work made for hire cannot ever be terminated, but every other agreement can be terminated. And we can talk about that more, but just keep that idea in your head. And when we get to the term of copyright, we can talk more about that. So to yes. transfer, yes. Um, just along the same lines, there have been times where I, uh, I have hired people to work within my studio with me doing the same things I do. Is it possible if I didn't have a, 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 a one of these uh, these signed pieces of paper about uh, work for hire that they could claim half of the things that I did? Yeah, probably uh, not half, but they could claim an interest. They could claim I can an interest. See yeah, you'd better get that in writing because authorship belongs to the creator 
and the copyrights in their creations belong to the creator unless they're transferred in writing. So if you have people in your employ who are collaborating and contributing to your work, even, I mean, you can argue that you're directing them and they're only just following your instructions. But, you know, if you're, if you're, if you've found people that are creative and are working with you, they may just have some contributions and it would be very wise for you to have a written agreement. And if someone does something really special and you want to acknowledge that and honor them, that's great. But legally you would own everything only if you have their signature. Oh, that makes so sense. studio assistants, get them to sign something. Yeah, okay, that's good to know. I just just as a, as a, as, a, as something that happened recently, somebody was at one, on the on one of our webs on one of our sites. Somebody asked for a copy of a commission contract, and I sort of intervened and said, "Don't put that on our public on our public um, for websites and stuff because that's that's some lawyer's contract that they wrote that we have no that you can't share. We have no right. We have no right to have that." Um, are there any anywhere that there are samples that are that legitimately people could call on to look for a work for hire uh, letter that would just be a simple letter that you know a lot of these relationships are just very casual when you have people working in the studio and it's sort of casual that you hire some students or whoever or, or people you know are talented uh, but they're pretty casual relationships and not usually signed off you know legally. So I guess, are there any examples of simple documents that people can look, refer to that you know of? There are um, there are a lot of things online and it, it would um, indicate whether you were free to copy them or not, depending on what website you're on. But there's, I know there, there's a wonderful organization and it used to be in Berkeley, I think it's still in Berkeley, California called NOLO Press. And they have form books and there's also, um, I'm not sure if the Copyright Alliance might have some help for you there. There's not a lot of copyrightable subject matter in these sorts of contracts because most of, I'm sure you've heard the term boilerplate. There's contract boilerplate where, you know, there's only so many ways of saying that you're signing this over and you indemnify for this or you, you know, uh, make this representation or you warrant that. So there's not a lot of creative language, you know, it, it's, it's definitely, you know, not um, Andrew Marvel or anything else. And so, um, so I think that, uh, you know, if you find a form somewhere, you're wise not to put it on your website, but, um, but there, but I do think that there's quite a lot available that it would be okay to use, but there's make sure that it part. doesn't have a copyright notice on the bottom, which says, you know, then you can't. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, this was a private attorney's contract, so mm -hmm. we didn't want to deal with that. Okay, thank you. No, 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 don't do that. Not yeah. without their permission. Bingo, thank you. Uh -huh. So, um, and I think we talked about um, transferring uh, transferring copyrights. Okay, um, now um, copyright uh, in the Constitution, which I'm, I won't quiz you on remembering what it said in the Constitution, but it said, um, to provide to authors and inventors for a limited time. And that limited time has grown and grown and grown. Initially, it was a very short period. Then it was 28 years. Then it was longer. Now it is the life of the author plus 70 years. And in the instance of a joint work, it would be the last surviving author. So for example, the Gershwins wrote music together, the Gershwin brothers, George and Ira, and one of them died, and I always get mixed up, decades before the other, the copyright in their jointly created music lasts until the second brother died plus 70 years. Wow. So um, you need to keep an eye on that. And then if a work is a work made for hire or it's anonymous or pseudonymous, then it's 95 years from the date of first publication or 125 years from creation, whichever comes first. It's a hell of a long time. Yeah. And um, people are constantly surprised that, oh my God, is that still under copyright? It, it does seem like a very long time. Um, and uh, I, I, 
you know, there's been a lot of argument about that. There's been cases that have gone to the Supreme Court saying that it's been extended too much, but the uh, court has upheld the life plus 70, um, even though it kind of operates as a uh, pension plan for the grandchildren of artists sometimes. Um, but anyway, that's how it works. So, um, so it lasts for a long time. And then um, in the old days, you had to renew. Um, you do not need to do that anymore. Uh, there's, it's one and done. You make one filing and you never have to um, make another filing to extend the, um, the term. Now, I mentioned this termination is an incredibly complicated thing, and we're not going to get into this. I mean, this is a scary slide, even with the picture next to it. Um, but the point is <clears throat> that um, I know I, I have taught at GW and, and AU Law, and I know that um, a very popular exam question is, if a contract says that you uh, transfer the copyrights for the full term of copyright, including any renewals or extensions, how long is the term? And, you know, the obvious answer is the life of the author plus 70 years or 95 years, you know, just the, the slide that we just looked at. But in fact, if you transfer by assignment or by some other contractual arrangement, you can terminate it 35 years down the road. And uh, it's a complicated procedure. You have to file with the copyright, you have to do with the copyright office and you have to do a notice in a certain way. But, but the idea was to, um, to give authors kind of a second bite of the apple that authors and artists of all sorts early in their career sometimes don't have very much bargaining power. And so they are, um, forced or feel forced to sign over their rights. And then they go on to great acclaim and uh, wish that they hadn't signed over those rights. Well, they can rip up that contract that they signed early in their career it, as long as it was not a work made for hire agreement. So um, that was why I was trying to make the distinction that the distinction might be very important for sculptors. If they can do an assignment of all rights, it can be terminated later. But if it's a work made for hire, that is if the sculpture is a, an element of a collective work, that's it. It's gone forever and you can't terminate it in any way, at least unless there's some other thing wrong with the contract. Um, so that's all we're going to say about that. It's way too complicated, but just keep that uh, in the back of your mind and it might be important to you at some point. Um, this we can't get into tonight. Restoration is a, an issue that um, when copyright, um, there was a Copyright Extension Act and there was a, a period where works in museums were um, in the public domain and then back under protection again. And um, I don't think we have time to get into that, but know that it exists. Now, copyright notice uh, used to be absolutely required. And if you didn't use it prior to March 1st, 1989, your rights were lost. Um, now uh, it is recommended, highly recommended, but not required. But if you created a sculpture prior to March 1st, 1989 and sold it, and it doesn't have a copyright notice on it, you might have trouble uh, enforcing your rights if somebody knows this rule, because this is the law. Um, and um, if today you create a sculpture and you don't, put a notice on it, you don't lose any rights, but if somebody copies it, they can say, oh, I didn't know that was your intellectual property. And they can be called an innocent infringer and be liable for much lower damages than if you have a notice on it. Now I know it's not attractive, but if you can find some place, you know, low down on the work or on the base or something, it is highly advisable to try to include that copyright notice if you can. 
um, and and registration um, it has always been recommended, but now since um, 2019, um, with our new uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, justices, uh, Justice Kavanaugh wrote a an opinion in the Fourth Estate, and now we and others concurred. And now um, you must have a certificate of registration before you can file a lawsuit. So that means that um, that means that if someone does copy your work and you don't have a registration, you are unable to file a lawsuit until you file an application and get the certificate, uh, or else you're not allowed into court. That's your ticket into court and. What that means, and we may have talked about this briefly in the first session, but what that means is that in a practical sense, the thing that gets you into court is often the thing that keeps you out of court. And let me just explain what I mean by that. If you write, a, or your attorney writes a demand letter or a cease and desist letter to somebody, and, and you say, this, you know, you have made unauthorized copies of my sculpture, and you must cease and desist, and if you don't, will have to sue you. Um, and they shake the envelope and no certificate or a copy of a certificate falls out and they know that you haven't registered. Bad guys will say, go sue me, knowing that you can't. But if you have that certificate and they have made unauthorized copies, they're gonna work out a settlement with you because they know it's a slam dunk for you to win. So again, the thing that allows you into court, can keep you out of court. And copyright registration is um, a pretty reasonably priced uh, step that you can take. It's a lot of the applications are only $65 and um, they're not that complicated. Um, and I highly recommend that, you know, if your works are popular and you're putting them on your website or you're, you know, selling them and showing them around, that it would be very smart and very wise, very prudent for you to file some uh, applications for registration. Hmm. Um, and here's some other benefits. It's a public record, uh, gets you into court. It's um, only certain remedies are available. Um, statutory damages is a really important one. If you've made a timely registration and if somebody infringes your work, <clears throat> Um, there are what are called statutory damages, which go as high as $150,000 per work. And you can get those damages um, without having to go through exhaustive discovery to prove actual damages. Um, and then um, it also helps if you're doing any international sales with customs, um, it, it helps you enforce your rights. So, so a question come in if I if I could ask. Absolutely. Um, yeah, of course. If um, even though there's no law stating that artists can be paid when a piece is resold, is this something that can be put into a sales contract? For instance, yes. the artist will receive ten percent of their work when if um, it, the work is resold. Yes, you can you can agree to that, and that's that's happening more and more now. I I see. I work with collectors and and artists and. Um, one thing that's that's becoming very common is a um, <clears throat> uh, a time frame of that because there you know there are successful artists who are frustrated because um, rich collectors are buying their works and then flipping them or sometimes even worse they're just putting them in storage someplace and no one ever gets to see them. But the flipping is extremely annoying to artists where they're just being treated like shares of stock. And except for they go up in value instead of going down in value the way stocks have been doing lately. But um, in any case, the um, what what artists have are doing is inserting in their sales agreements um, a condition that says that, if you wish to sell within X period of time, and what I've been I've been seeing one year, I've been seeing two years, three years, I've been seeing five years, but I haven't seen anything longer than that. That if you're going to sell the work within this time period, 
then you have to give the artist the option to buy it back uh, and to consult with the artist before that sale is, um, so they have a right of first refusal. Um, and then um, the other thing that you could say is that if you sell within this time period, and again, it could be one year, three years, five years, and I haven't seen anything longer than that, but you could push the limit or try to, um, that you get a percentage uh, of the profit that they made. So if you've sold the piece for 10,000 and they sell it for 20,000, the, ten oh, come on, the 10,000 profit, um, the $10,000 profit, sorry, would uh, you would get X percent, perhaps 10% of that. And some, some collectors, some buyers will agree to that. Others may lose interest. You may have to negotiate to a lower percentage. You may, um, you know, you may chill the sale, I don't know, um, but it's, it is becoming more and more common. And um, you know, I encourage you to explore those options and to keep more control of your work and the profits that result if you can. Um, <clears throat> now, I just wanted to list that copyright is not an absolute right, and it has to be balanced with all sorts of things. Um, there is, of course, the First Amendment, and we want people to be talking about our art and literature and works, and so, um, and if you're going to talk about a work of visual art, you often have to show a picture of it. Um, so do you know that that could happen? Um, then there are property rights. So the owner of a uh, of of your sculpture, um, if someone buys your sculpture, they have the right to loan that to a museum. They have the right to loan that to a gallery. That's an exception to the right of public display um, that is shared with the owner of the physical object. Um, and then the first sale uh, doctrine um, doesn't really have much, uh, the idea that somebody buys something and then they can resell it, it's their right to do that. Fair use, we're gonna have to talk about a little bit more. Uh, statutory licenses are um, re really just for music. Uh, music under copyright is basically an economic right, not, a, not controlled the way the uh, visual artists can control their works. Um, so, <clears throat> so here we go. This is the section of the uh, copyright statute that applies to fair use, section 107. So criticism, if somebody reviews your, your uh, you're in an exhibit and um, they want to talk about your work, of course they can use an image to discuss the beautiful lines and symmetry or the uh, shocking uh, imagery or whatever it is. And, um, and you want that and that's a good thing. Uh, so criticism, commentary, news reporting, teaching, these are all fair use. And then these are factors, and these are non-exclusive factors, but these four factors must be examined. And um, so the purpose and the character of the use, is it educational? Is it um, commercial? You know, who's making the use? Is it a nonprofit educational organization? Is it a corporation putting it on the, a picture on the cover of their, um, you know, annual report? Um, and then the other, thing as part of factor number one is whether the use is transformative. Now, I want to talk about that at some length, um, but I think we should keep moving through the statute and then come back to this. But right now, there's a case before the Supreme Court involving Andy Warhol and the photographer Lynn Goldsmith. Um, and it is a very important case for all, for all authors, especially for visual artists as to how fair use and these factors are interpreted. Um, for a while, this first factor was so important that courts weren't really looking much at the other three, and that's not a good idea. So the court now is returning to its prior approach of, as they should, 
of applying all the factors and whether it's transformative is a question, not the question that needs to be asked and answered. Then the second factor is the nature of the copyrighted work, the underlying work. Um, more, yes, Joan. One, two, two things, one is what does whether it's transformative mean? I didn't get what it means. Whether oh, the use well, of what does that mean? In other words, in other words, when when a um, if somebody uh, makes an exact copy of your um, of your sculpture, there's been no transformation. They've just okay. taken your right. okay. work and they've okay. made another copy without your okay. permission, without your um, you know, without any license or payment or whatever. But if they've taken your work and they've um, shrunk it you know, from three feet to an inch and a half, and they've placed it in uh, mm -hmm. a, a larger context, and they've painted it red, and they've, you know, it may be that they've made so many changes okay. that your work is scarcely even recognizable anymore because they have transformed it. And right. if you know who know your work can look carefully and say, wait a minute, See that little thing in the background of that diorama? That's my sculpture. It may be that it has become just an element of some other work uh, so that it has been sufficiently transformed that it's fair use. But um, that test is not the only test that needs to be um, instituted and, um, and it is stricter now in its application than it was for a while. Right. Um, factor number two goes to, uh, sculptors are gonna win this factor pretty much every time. The, um, there is greater latitude given to the fair use of factual rather than creative works. So when an historian or a journalist uses words from some other source, um, it, it is more likely that it would be fair use than not. In other words, fa facts we already know are not copyrightable. And so if someone is talking about, you know, that such and such happened, you know, that there was an event in the ca on Capitol Hill on January 6th, no one owns that. And if someone is writing about that and they may even use some of the same adjectives, you see, you know, news stories repeating things. Um, there's much, much wider latitude for fair use for those factual works than there are for creative works such as sculpture. Then the third, the third factor is the amount uh, and substantiality um, of the uh, portion used. So if, a, say, a, let's say figurative sculpture, and they, uh, some sculptor takes, you know, the arm from some, the right arm from somebody's work and the left arm from somebody else's, and they put it on a torso that they bought, you know, from Bloomingdale's, and then they put a head on it from somebody else. And so that they're only taking pieces of things and putting it together it may be it may be that that would be considered fair use. However, if they took the head of your figurative sculptor sculpture and that head was the key to the work, and they took that, you know, rather than the left foot, um, it may be that even if that was only a small part, but it was crucial, then it would not be fair use. So it's the quantity and the quality, the nature of what has been copied. And then the fourth factor is the effect on the market value. So that if somebody um, you know, is uh, churning out things and uh, these um, adaptations, and maybe they're sort of transformative, but they're usurping the market for your work, while they're doing these variations in different colors and scales, um, you know, and you're being denied of any licensing fee um, or any other sort of financial arrangement between you and this new artist, then um, that factor would go to the sculptor. 
And then the, I, I said in the beginning, these are non-exclusive factors, meaning that other things can affect it. Sometimes good faith is called the fifth fair use factor. If people think what they're doing is okay and they've thought about this and, and they've you know, consulted a lawyer and you don't agree with their interpretation, it may be that their good faith would be considered. Um, it may be that it wouldn't count, but you know, it, may, it may be a factor. Um, so um, there's a lot of other limitations and exceptions um, mostly these uh, do not apply to works of sculpture, um, but there are a lot of other exceptions. And then, um, then we wanted to, I wanted to talk just briefly about infringement. Um, so you have to be the owner of a valid copyright. And as I said, if you're a conceptual artist, you may not have a copyright. So that would be a problem. Or if you've, uh, sold your work as a work made for hire, you may not have your copyright. That would be now with the purchaser. Um, and then you would have to show unauthorized copying of protected expression. So those are two elements that you would have to show. E evidence of infringement, either direct evidence or circumstantial evidence. And, and the, I'm gonna flip through these quickly. Um, so there's different kinds of defendants that you can, there are those that have direct liability um, and then there's contributory liability um, and those would be people. So for example, maybe um, somebody um, uh, made copies and then hired someone to sell them for them so that a gallery is uh, distributing or some other uh, commercial enterprise is selling these unauthorized copies. So anyone in that chain of distribution, the, um, the creator of the infringing work, the distributor of the infringing work, if anybody was helping to market and advertise, those people would all be contributing to, um, to the infringement and would be what the law calls joint and severally liable so that if you had uh, a registration and wanted to file suit, you could file against all of those as defendants and they would all be liable. And I mentioned before that good faith is a factor, but copyright law is what's called a strict liability statute. So there, their good faith and their well-meaning intentions or their research, you know, um, may, may go to lower damages, but it wouldn't absolve them um, and forgive their sin. They would still be an infringer. It's a strict liability statute, even if their hearts were pure or their minds were mixed up. Vicarious liability is sort of like contributory, but it, it means that um, you may not be directly involved with the reproduction and distribution, but you have an interest in it. So if you, um, if there was for this nefarious enterprise that's infringing your uh, copyright and making unauthorized copies, if there was an investor, uh, for example, who uh, paid for the website or paid for the gallery exposure or paid for ads in a newspaper, um, <clears throat> then they would be liable not as a direct uh, um, a direct infringer or even as a <clears throat> contributory infringer, but uh, vicariously. <clears throat> and then more recently, although it's been a while now, but inducement is a, um, a concept that copyright has borrowed from patent uh, cases. Um, and it uh, came up in the Grokster case where there were uh, there was music being offered um, in such a way as to induce people to infringe, and that could happen on websites uh, that were offering sculpture as well. <clears throat> so then there these are the remedies I mentioned: actual damages, where you would have to prove what your work is worth, what it's usually sold for, how um, you know 
how you have been financially impacted by not being able to get this value for your work. Then there's the statutory damages, which as I said, can go all the way up to 150,000 per work. <clears throat> the um, attorney's fees and costs can only be reimbursed if you've made a timely registration of copyright. And then there's injunctions where the court rules, you gotta stop this right away and pull things uh, from, um, <clears throat> from commerce. Uh, sometimes there's impounding, sometimes there's destruction. These are all remedies that are available if you've registered. Um, then there is, <clears throat> and this is becoming more and more important in our digital age, the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. Um, <clears throat> and if, you're, if digital copies of your sculpture, in other words, if you have a website and you put up photos on your website and you have paid for those photographs and you own those photographs and you own the website and you own the sculpture and someone starts um, <clears throat> reproducing copies of those digital images, um, then you have a, an option of enforcing <clears throat> through the uh, DMCA by sending them a notice uh, and then they would be <clears throat> um, they would be um, obligated to um, respond to that notice by taking things down from their website expeditiously. Um, that's what the statute said, which has been interpreted to mean 24 to 48 hours uh, while you sort out whether they have the right to have things on their website or not. Um, <clears throat> so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but again, if the photograph doesn't belong to you because you paid the photographer to take the picture, then that was that was sort of the basis of my question because most of what we're doing digitally is not physically handling the sculpture when in all, most exchanges these days are visual. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but with COVID, a lot of it was just digital. So, and a lot of those digital images are not owned by they may have been paid for, but the copyright ownership is not in the hands of the of the artist. So, if you were if you were in that position, then you would need to coordinate with the photographer. Yeah, if you didn't I, the own reason the I'm bringing this up, Janet, is I think that a lot of our members who may have websites that use images that were either either purchased or on a, or maybe if they're their own images, that's something else. But if they're using a professional photographer, I think then folks may want to be aware of that and, and either going forward or retroactively change some of that. Well, I had mentioned, um, we did talk about this first thing and um, the best thing, and now here's another reason why it's the best thing is to make it a work made for hire. <clears throat> uh, if you're not able to do that um, or to get a full assignment or an, or an exclusive license, then um, the other thing would be to have in your purchase agreement um, a clause that said that they would cooperate with um, uh, an infringement suit in the event that someone copies the photograph of your work. Thank you, thank you. That would be a backup. Yeah. Um, okay, so then um, DMCA has four safe harbors. Most of them are pretty technical. The, the only one that's really of help is the notice and takedown. Um, and then um, the remedies. Now, one good thing is that DMCA um, doesn't require a certificate of registration. So that could be helpful. And, um, and it has its own schedule of, of Statutory damage, damages, which are uh, capped at 25,000, not 150,000. So it is, again, better to file a, um, an application for registration. Mm -hmm. Criminal, there are very, very few cases of uh, criminal copyright infringement. This means that a, 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 you know, a court, the Department of Justice um, or a, a federal court would have to go after somebody. And it's really only in cases of extreme piracy. Almost all copyright cases that we are learn about and, and uh, that are important are mm -hmm. private uh, civil 
excuse me, civil cases where one party is suing another. Um, and that was all. Now I did want to show, let me see if I can figure out how I'm going to do this. I'm going to escape from there. And then I'm going to go, um, hmm, how am I going to do this? Okay, I wanted to show you a couple of examples. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. We're, seeing, we're seeing a screen with a lot of photographs. With a lot of, yeah. a lot of pictures. Jeff Koons pictures. Yeah. Yep, this is, this is an old copyright case. Wait, I'm trying to get one of these to go up big, but maybe that's the best we're going to do. Um, uh, there was a, a photographer named uh, um, Art Rogers who took a picture in black and white of two people. Um, can you see where my arrow is here? Yes. Um, this black and white picture that the photographer Art Rogers took of um, two people holding puppies on their lap. And, um, oh, come on. God. Sorry. It's okay, I'm Janet. It gives, gives us 30 seconds to breathe and take it all in. And then yes, I'm sorry. I am throwing a lot of stuff at you. It's so, okay. the, so this, this, um, and then Jeff Koons, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, Jeff Koons uh, saw a note card um, th uh, that Art Rogers had made note cards, and you know, a note card that opens up, and on the back of it, it had copyright Art Rogers and the year of creation, which I don't want to misstate, so I'll, I will leave that blank for now. Um, Jeff Koons ripped off the back half of it that had the copyright notice, and he sent the photo to his fabricator in Milan and said, make this 3D. And the fabricator made it into this three-dimensional full-color uh, sculpture, which there was a limited edition. Mary Boone Gallery sold it. Anyway, it was there was a um, lawsuit in the Southern District and then went up to the uh, Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And the court said, this is not fair use. Jeff Koons was arguing that he had transformed from black and white to color, from two, dimensionals, two dimensions to three dimensions, that he had made other changes, creative choices, making the dogs blue and so forth, and that it was transformative and that it represented um, commentary on society and dog ownership and whatever. And the court said, no that this was in a copyright infringement. But then over the years, um, the court- This was not a copyright infringement. This was not a this copyright, was, this was yeah. copyright was infringement. Okay. It was not fair use. Right. It was not sufficiently transformative. But over the years, other cases, including other Jeff Koons cases, were deemed fair use for frankly, less transformation than this. But, um, and the court had, in my view, kind of gotten lost along the way. So now there is a case, I mentioned this before, before the Supreme Court, and it's, um, this is the Andy Warhol, um, Lynn Goldsmith case. It is, it is two dimensions only, but uh, Lynn Goldsmith took photos of the artist known as Prince, and, and, and this is not to be, well, anyway, there's, of course, the artist Richard Prince, but this is the musician. Mm -hmm. She photographed him for um, Vanity Fair magazine. And um, Vanity Fair uh, requested that, um, that she provide a photo that would be used as source material for an illustration. And their plan was to send the photograph to Andy Warhol, who would do his posterization the way he did with so many photographs. And he did, and it was used in um, Vanity Fair magazine with credit to both Andy Warhol and Lynn Goldsmith. Lynn Goldsmith was licensed and paid for her use. Andy Warhol was licensed and paid for his use and life went on. Well, then, Sometime later, quite a bit of time later, Lynn Goldsmith dis discovered that Andy Warhol had taken that photograph and made a whole bunch of other images with other colors and made limited edition prints and sold them for huge amounts of money. 
And she never knew about it, never got any credit, mm -hmm. never heard anything about it. And she was pretty annoying. So she filed um, the lawsuit and the lower court, I'm gonna stop doing this now. Um, and the lower court, uh, the lower court said um, that it was fair use. And then the second circuit reversed and said, no, no, this is, this is not fair use. This is, um, this is copyright infringement. And now it's um, before the Supreme Court and all summer long, people all over the art world were uh, attorneys were drafting what are called amicus briefs, Samiki briefs, uh, arguing mostly in favor of, almost all, in favor of uh, Lynn Goldsmith and saying what I've just been saying, that the court has gotten a little loosey-goosey with fair use and we need to have these guardrails put back on and we need to have all four factors, not just transformation, but all of those factors, the nature of the work, the quantity and substantiality, the effect on the market, all of those things have to be examined and uh, before a determination of fair use can be made. So there's going to be hearings um, next month and then um, there will be an opinion whenever but it's going to be a very important case, not just for Lynn Goldsmith, but for visual artists, um, including sculpt works of sculpture, to including sculptors, to see um, how fair use is going to be applied going forward. And um, fingers crossed that um, that they will see that all four factors are important, that we can't just look at the first factor because um, the big problem is that if, even if there is transformation, unless it is extreme transformation, it doesn't really, um, it, it, if you only look at that, you are removing the right of the artist to, to authorize or not the creation of derivative works. So for example, to move to different kinds of work than sculpture just for a minute, uh, let's say that um, a writer uh, writes a book and somebody decides they wanna make a movie based on that book. Um, obviously that's transformative. It's a different medium. It's, you know, there's actors, there's lighting, there's music, there's all kinds of things going on. That's highly transformative. But should the writer of the book not get some licensing fee, not get some credit? I mean, that's crazy. So, um, so by just looking at this transformative category and not looking at the other categories, the right of the of adaptation, the right to grant, the right to create derivative works has been completely removed. So cross your fingers that the court looks at this sensibly, that Lynn Goldsmith's case is um, the, at the, the decision of the second circuit in favor of Lynn Goldsmith and her case is uh, affirmed and that, um, that you, your work cannot be uh, copied and, you know, just if it's painted red, you know, or, or orange or purple, the way Andy Warhol did, that, um, that that's enough to make it fair use, because I think we, we need to have some more, um, some more guidelines than that. So, um, so I think um, I have gotten through all of the things that I wanted to say of, oh, you know what else I wanted to, oh boy, I've gone out of my, no wait, let me see if I know how to. I wanted to talk just briefly about um, uh, VARA, the Visual Artist Rights Act, and how that has been interpreted by courts. And um, I'm gonna go back to the internet one more time. And, um, and I'm going to go to a, a new, I, some of you may be familiar with Five Points. Does that name mean anything to you? Um, no. Okay, so um, Five Points was 
um, uh, a location in, um, again, this is two dimensional, but it's important for you. Historically, the, um, the moral rights, uh, there've been a lot of cases and the artist always loses. Um, it, you know, in, in the law, there are parties that always win. There used to be the joke about, um, you know, the bank always won, no matter who was suing them, the bank always won. And there's certain parties that always prevail, no matter, no matter what's going on. Um, there, was one, um, there was one case, um, and it involved the um, children's, um, I don't know, it was some disabled children versus playboy. Now, who do you think is going to win? You know, I mean, there's some cases where you can pretty much the children won. You can pretty much imagine who's going to get um, the uh, the upper hand. And historically, although art was respected, property rights in this country are are supreme. And the idea that that someone's property um, could be undercut by someone painting a mural on it, that that, you know, that, that that was, the courts just didn't get it. So many, many cases were, were filed um, asserting, a, um, asserting an infringement of the right of attribution and or integrity and the artist lost over and over and over again. It was very rare that an artist won. And then came five points. Five Points was this place in, in, um, in New York, in Queens, and it became a tourist attraction. And all of these mural artists painted, um, painted murals on this building with the permission of the property owner. And they were curated and some were allowed to stay for a certain length of time. Others were painted over and replaced. And it was, I mean, there were like tourist buses that came there and lunch, lunch trucks that, started coming there and it became this whole um, important economic uh, point in, um, in uh, New York. And then um, the artists were being threatened by the building, the demolition of the building. And they were arguing that there needed to be some preservation of their works before the building was knocked down. And in the middle, in the middle of the lawsuit, the owner of the building um, went ahead and one night when uh, nobody was looking, um, he whitewashed the whole thing. And um, I'm trying to find a picture of where that happened. Uh, let's see. Um, and it was, um, it was pretty shocking. And the court was um, the court was astonished. I, I guess this is what we want to see here. Right. So um, so one night, one morning, during while the trial was going on, and the court was outraged that that they would just paint over uh, all of these murals while there while there you know the court was ongoing. Um, the judge was furious that it was disrespectful to the law, disrespectful to that particular court and that particular judge. Anyway, um, that particular um, real estate developer wound up having a judgment against him for, I think it was $6.5 million that was distributed to all of the artists whose work was covered over. And from that point going on, which is just a few years ago, um, I think there, there is now a much greater respect for Vera and a much higher probability that a, um, a claim of integrity and attribution would be honored and upheld by the court since we have this great precedent in the Second Circuit. So I just wanted to show these pictures Apologies if everyone is, if this was old news to everyone, but I think that um, there, there was the feeling for a while that artists didn't want to bother with, uh, you know, with Vera because you never win, but now you might. Joan, did you have a comment? Well, the, the only comment I have is it's 8.30, 
And yeah, we're out of time. Our program mm -hmm. is from seven to eight thirty, and I'm I want to honor our commitment to our members. Um, uh, there are a bunch of questions that came up in the chat, and so I would like to sort of I guess the way to do it most effectively is to honor the fact that it's eight thirty. Thank you officially and formally, and say we're over, but we'll keep recording and we'll keep live for those of us okay. who want to stay. If you're okay with that, Janet, and if other I folks can stay for a, I can stay for a little while for a few questions. Um, okay, that'd be lovely. We um, have some questions in the chat, and if there's anything else that you wanted to be sure we heard. So, as we would you would you want to look through the questions on the chat? Definitely. You know, and I want to honor our folks who came on time. So, Lisa Hill, thank you, um, had a question. Can you address the issue of using found images within collage? Um, well, it depends what the images are. I mean, if you have found images that are in the public domain, go for it. In other words, if you have found images that were created, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, Rembrandt and Leonardo. I mean, if you find images that are in the public domain, you can do whatever you want. If you have found images that are um, photographs um, by a living photographer or by a living visual artist, and they're going to figure prominently in your work, then you're going to have to think about whether you need to get a license or whether you have met these those factors. Look at those factors, those four fair use factors. You know, have you transformed that image? You know, um, how much of the work have you taken? Are you taking just a part of the picture, or are you taking the whole image? Um, uh, you know, do you think this will undercut? the artist's ability to market their own work. Um, you know, what, what is the nature of that underlying image? Um, so you'll have to go through that fair use analysis and determine whether, um, whether you can um, use it freely or whether you have to um, uh, make some arrangement with the artist. Now, there is a, um, a gray area, uh, in other words, uh, the courts always decide this was authorized fair use, authorized because it's fair use, or this is unauthorized and infringing. But there's a middle ground that I sometimes recommend to people, and that is that you can contact the artist and say, um, you know, I'm an artist and I'm creating this work, and I'm incorporating a number of images, including yours, which was very intriguing to me. And I hope you um, have no objections. And um, you know, if you, I'm going to be having a, a reception for my work on such and such a day, and you know, you, you can come. And I'm thinking about acknowledging all of the source material. And if I do that, you know, how would you like to be uh, credited? And notice that I'm not saying how much is your license going to cost me or making any financial arrangement, but just kind of saying, this is what I'm doing. And I, you know, I think your work is great. And I hope you like my work and come to the party. And, you know, I, I, I hope this is all OK. And that works a lot of time. So depending on, you know, how prominent the work is and how crucial it is to you, um, you know, all of those things can matter. So I hope I've answered that question. Right. In on. other words, it, de it depends. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I know Sally had a follow up question. Sally, would you like to pose your question um, if it kind of changed based on that information just now? Um, well, actually, I wanted to bring up a totally <laughs> different question um, on the question of the, um, the WARA. Um, um, I recently encountered a situation of someone who had commissioned it's it's a gas station near me and they had commissioned a mural on the building next to their station which is a nice fun mural and now the people who own the building want to tear it down and i said oh what about wara um Vara, um um and vara i'm sorry and the problem was it was commissioned so my question is what about artists who may want to see their work protected but there's somebody who's gonna kind of pay them to paint it on the wall. Is there some way to do a contract where 
it isn't really a work for hire so that it gets the VARA protection. Am yes. I saying that? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, this is, I, I, I'm sure the artist would have liked this one preserved. And I know the gas station was like trying to get people to sign petitions to preserve it. Um, but it, it clear, it seemed clearly to have been a work for hire. Was this a, the gas station on the corner in Chelsea in New York? Is that what you're talking about? No, no, about? this is a, this is near Tinley Circle in Washington, D.C. Oh, oh, that's interesting. And, I'm not Tenley familiar with this. Motors. Um, and, and the thing is that, that they had definitely hired an artist to do it. And as I understand, Vara, it doesn't apply to works for hire. Correct. If the, if a yeah. work made for hire agreement was signed, it's too late now for the artist yeah. to to protest. But is there some way artists could do a way of protecting themselves, their work, while still getting paid while they're making it? Okay. In other words, um, is there a way to have something be a work for be paid for something and and it isn't a work for hire? Maybe yes. that's the way. I yes, I mean artists. Oh darn! I thought I was waving my arms enough there. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, the artist. Yes, in the in the commission in the work to the commission agreement. Why I'm all blurry. Um, in that work, you can have a clause that says, I don't know why I'm all blurry. Um, in that ah, there I am. In that in that agreement, the sales agreement, you can you can have conditions that um, you know that if there is you know if the building is going to be sold or re renovated or uh, or destroyed that that the artist will be notified and that um, you know sometimes murals can be removed and um, so the artist may want to uh, you know at the outset be creative about having a layer um, that can be removed. That's one way to protect. And then the other thing is that um, that you at least be given the opportunity to to document it and photograph it, even if it can't be removed, at least it can be documented. Um, and um, so there's, you know, you can put anything in any kinds of conditions. I mean, they may not agree to it, but you can try to get conditions like that. And then the other thing is that remember <clears throat> that it may not qualify as a work made for hire because a mural is not one of the nine categories of work made for hire. So only if it's a contribution to a collective work. In other words, if they say, well, your sculpture or your mural is just one element of the design of this and the other elements are, and they need to be able to list three or four other things, landscaping or architecture or something else. And if they're not able to come up with other elements, if this is just a freestanding mural or a freestanding sculpture, it, it, it may not be a work made for hire, even though they pretended that and called it that, it may not be a work made for hire because it has to be one of those nine enumerated categories in the statute. And sculpture ain't one of them, nor is mural. Mm. Okay. My, my, now, my my original question that I put in the chat was um, to a discussion about just whether you photographing copyrighted works, what um, what use can you make? And and you already I think talked about the difference, as I understood it, that if you photograph a three dimensional work, the photographer has the copyright. Um, so that may that may have kind of answered my question. Um, yeah, I think generally for sculptors, the the because um, there's so many decisions as to how it's lit, what the angle is, you know how how um, you know how they approach it. I I think that there's a fair amount of creativity in that, as distinguished as I said from photographing two dimensional objects. But, but then so that the best thing. It, the best thing is to get a, some agreement in in writing that that says um, you own this, but we're going to coordinate if there's any infringements, or you know, to make it clear what you can do and what you can't do, and how but, far your but, rights extend. But that means then that the photographer, that the sculptors really have no protection. Say someone waltzes down to the National Gallery and they take photographs of the big red 
big blue chicken and they sell oodles of postcards of it, there's nothing they can do. There's nothing the sculptor can do about that, really. Well, it depends. I mean, if the photograph is, if, if it is, um, if there's nothing, I mean, if the lighting is not highly creative and the, and the, the object depicted is basically all that the photograph is about, um, you could argue that the, um, that the authorship was uh, de minimis of the sculptor, uh, excuse me, of the photographer and that the, um, and that the sculptor's rights were being, were being infringed. Oh, okay. um, I'd have to see an example of it, but, um, mm -hmm. but it is possible that there would be some, some rights there. Um, and um, in the same way that, you know, there's been a lot of litigation lately about photographs of people on Instagram where the photographers are claiming rights, but oops, they're forgetting that there's rights that the people depicted have in their, you know, yeah. in their public image. Yeah. And um, so you could also argue, and we haven't talked about this at all, but you could also argue that there could be either trade mark or trade dress rights. In other words, if your uh, sculpture, if you have a distinctive style and the photographer uh, depicts that, obviously, by taking a picture of your work and then doesn't give you credit for that, um, there's a section of the uh, trademark of the Lanham Act um, that doesn't require any trademark registration. But um, if there could be confusion as to the affiliation or the source or the involvement of the sculpture, of the sculptor, then um, it could be an infringement of your um, trademark or trade dress rights. Mm. If, if the photographer is palming that off as you know, just some random thing and everybody, you know, it, it's highly recognizable, it may be that they're um, interfering with your um, trademark or trade dress rights. I hate to be the big blue meanie. I am wearing blue, but it's uh, <laughs> 845. Yeah, I think we do have a couple of slides. I don't know, uh, Asma, if you can access those or- Right now I have one, to- uh, Okay, for sure. And then, and then I do want to say a giant, huge thank you, but let's move we'll on to this final and then- Definitely, and hopefully you can see my slides. Janet's wonderful picture, of course. All right, <laughs> we definitely wanted to share these references. And um, the great thing is if you've registered for tonight, um, we will definitely share the slides. Um, because I know that I was copying copious notes um, and I've always learned so much from Janet and team. So thank you. And then of NFTs, we never got to NFTs. Yeah. So there are two articles here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go back. If you just go back to the two articles. Yeah. The, uh, list. It's like moving on its own. <laughs> one, more, yeah, one more back up. Yeah. One more back up. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Yeah, you got to start with start with the ABCs and then look at the um, at the uh, the other article. So the blog piece gives you some if you, unless you know all about NFTs already, start with the ABCs and then do the article. And um, the I, let me just say briefly that the law around NFTs is very much in flux. I always like to see people settling, but I was actually really hoping that the Quentin Tarantino, the, um, the Miramax v. Quentin Tarantino case wouldn't settle so that we'd get some, some court ruling that would g give us some rules uh, for going forward, but they settled. Um, so now there's another case in, in New York that um, in, is involving a, uh, a mural and uh, an NFTs made by a gallery of this mural and I'm hoping, and again, I, I, I want people to settle things, but I, again, I'm kind of hoping that one of these cases doesn't settle so that we can get um, something that will help the rest of us know what the hell the law is on NFTs because it's pretty confusing at this point. But read these articles, 
and um, and we'll watch and see. And maybe next year we'll have a program on NFTs and we'll know more about it. There okay, you go. Thank you. Sign me up for sure. And of course, we want to share about the Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts, WALA, and our, you know, my slides keep moving around, and the Copyright Alliance, the unified voice of the copyright community. And of course, some good literature on the streets there, Art Law, the Guide for Collectors, Investors, Dealers, and Art, my screen is, uh, and Artists, <laughs> and then Art Law and Transactions, of course. So all here, good. thank you for all these resources. Once again, we want to tell you that please go to the Washington Sculptors um, .org website, um, sign up, put a gallery out there, communicate with us. And uh, if you want to reach out directly to me, social at WashingtonSculptors.org. We'd love to share about your work um, and get connected. And we've got some upcoming events, of course. Uh, we are a busy group and all volunteer organizations, so we need your help wherever you can. Congratulations to the artists, the WSG artists that are part of Renewal. So definitely a round of applause for all of you and the great work happening. Um, a couple days from now, woo, a couple days from now, we have our Zoom happy hour coming up. Please join us. We've had a great cohort. Uh, joining on the third Wednesday of each month. And then also Artina is installed. So a lot of great artists have put their work on the, the grounds of um, the Sandy Spring Museum. So please check it out. And the enduring ever-present um, installation of past and present at Oxen Hill Manor. If you haven't gone, it's an incredible space. Uh, please join us until 2023, September 15th incredible. So, and if you aren't a member or you are a member, now's a great time to think about renewing that membership and looking at, uh, you know, look, looking forward to these wonderful programs that we have, becoming a professional in the art world series, um, just so many good nuggets each and every month for each and every one of you. So thank you. And once again, I want to send it back to Joan and Eric for any closing remarks. Well, my only closing remarks are to Janet first, with huge and giant thank yous. I am not a sculptor, as all of our members know. I learned enormously from you and and found last night, I, I and I know I'm gonna look back at this one again too, uh, just so worthwhile, so useful, and so helpful to our members. So thank you, thank you. Um, and WALA as an organization is available for folks, artists who do not have a lot of resources, um, they can apply and will can be guided through or have legal legal assistance, and so that's wor it's well worth knowing about the Washington Area Lawyer for the Arts. And so thank you, Janet, and thank you to members who joined us tonight. This was one more very exciting and very excellent program. So thank you, thank you all, and thanks everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Janet. We're going to call you. you again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye all. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good night. Bye-bye.